Existence is coexistence, and coexistence is melancholy. And melancholy just is the persistence of a rift between essence and appearance. Isn't this what gives Lars von Trier's film Melancholia its stunning appeal? And isn't this why it was a brilliant choice to use the prelude of Wagner's Tristan and Isolde with its agonizingly beautiful Tristan chord, a chord that can't make up its mind, a chord that embodies the rift I'm talking about here. The chord is suspended just as the rift suspends. From the suspension flows what we call time and space. Time is not a neutral box in which objects float, but it's rather an emission of objects themselves, part of their appearance, the way in which they are always appearing slightly different from their own selves. Likewise, space. Happily, this is quite in accord with Einstein, for whom space-time is an emergent property of objects, not a rigid framework in which objects are extended. Thus also the choice to depict people, birds and other things moving in ultra-slow motion, like the video art of Bill Viola that in the opening shot of Melancholia was a stroke of genius. A stroke of genius in slow motion evokes the way in which time seeps out of things themselves. Time and space are aesthetic phenomena. Indeed, there is some kind of gesture towards scientific realism here, since the proximity of a massive object's gravitational field would indeed slow down time. And this is the plot of the film, a gigantic planet, a hyper-object, par excellence, is heading on a collision course with Earth. It is as if everything in that opening sequence is happening in the presence of a gigantic entity that is invisible, rendered as slow motion. As if we, outside the movie screen, existed in one temporality that was suddenly seen as relative, not absolute, distorted by awareness of a huge object. The invisible withdrawn essence of the thing is made visible in the slow motion and in the agonizing wonderful horror of course of Tristan and Isolde, the opera that confuses love and death. Another reference perhaps is to Zeno's paradox. Zeno repeats the idea that space and time can be subdivided by imagining motion as a sequence of stillnesses that can be divided infinitely, thus never arriving at its destination. Cinema, too, imagines the movement as a sequence of stillnesses or stills, the knowledge of the end of closure, which isn't simply a mathematical end, but rather the feeling of ending, that is, the collapse of the rift between essence of an appearance, leaving behind only the shadow of appearance as such becomes the very object of our movie going to light, our agonized, pleasurable inspection. It is as if pleasure is fed back into the feeling of being in the middle. That is the feeling of existence, of things being suspended, the rifting of the rift from which flow the rippling waves of space-time. And that this feeling of middle is itself fed into aperture, the feeling of beginning, which is a sublime interruption of a smooth ignorance, a double take in which we always belatedly notice the existence of a fresh rift in things, a fresh rift between essence and appearance. We know how this will end. The open, dark futurality of a thing is suspended in slow motion before our eyes. An action replay. This is yet another reference in that opening shot. Something has already, already happened. This defines beginning. Lovingly, melancholically, fetishistically, an action replay relives a moment we already know is coming. Are we digesting life into an inert and organic quiescence? As James Trophy beautifully translates the Freud, are we being stirred into yet more agonizing life? The sadistic accuracy of sports television and slow motion orgasm shots in porno becomes the masochistic intensity of uh, reliving a moment in which we know we aren't outside the universe looking in, like spectators in a cinema, but are wedged firmly in between other beings, human, sentient, living, non-living. The film gazes at us. The film is an animal for the gigantic planet coming asymptotically ever closer, a rift whose very existence is the premonition of another death and thus speaks to a radical infinity of being. Form is appearance. Appearance is the past. Another way to say this is that appearance is the footprint of at least one other object. This glass is a record of how a hot liquid was poured into a mold, how my greasy fingers slipped one day and chipped it with a knife, how the dishwasher dulled its sparkle. A poem is a certain form, just this delineation, just that rhyme scheme, just this stanza form, just those images. Poems are records of causal aesthetic decisions. To read a poem is to be an archaeologist. For Ero, the physical form of an object is formed as and formed by. Freud argues that the ego just is the precipitate of abandoned object cathexes. What if we inverted this phrase and asserted that the form of objects is their ego? If ego is object-like, then the inverse applies. The identity of this glass is the way it was shaped as a glass. 
Form is memory, as in a memory stick. Your face, your hard drive, your tick coffee mug records what happened to it. What is called the past is really other objects that coexist with the object in question. When we hold a glass, we are holding the past. As we saw earlier, there is a profound rift between the appearance of the glass and the essence of the glass, which is not the same as the difference between an undifferentiated block and a defined shape of stone neck weight. Sparkle itself, for lack of a better way to put it, is the difference between a glass and a glass. What is the difference between a duck? One of its legs is both the same. The glass is a glass, and an uncanny not glass. The existence of a form is the existence of a kind of memory which is evidence of a withdrawn essence. Freud argues that the unconscious is some kind of indescribable surface. He uses the analogy of the mystic writing pad. Derrida has a marvelous McLuhan-like essay on it, since Freud is in effect admitting that the unconscious is what Derrida calls archi-writing, namely a technological device that subtends meaning. When you use a mystic writing pad, you erase the wax paper, but the impression of the writing stays on the wax tablet beneath. Script is inscribed in an object. What Freud is hinting at is that the memory is object-like, and that objects have memory. The very appearance of a thing, then, is, is a melancholy trace of its essence, which I am unable to locate anywhere in optically given space or time. This withdrawn essence is nowhere but in this glass I'm holding, yet it is unavailable to me. Moreover, the essence of the glass is unavailable to any other entity whatsoever. These other entities include the very things that form the glass, mold, molten sand, dishwasher, knife, greasy fingers. My melancholy experience of the glass, by definition, is only one of the vast host of melancholy apprehensions of the glass in whatever way molds, sand, dishwashers and so on carry out their business. I am far from saying that my dishwasher is alive or sentient. I am saying, in fact, that my sentience and aliveness isn't very different from the appearance of a dishwasher. When, in a state of depression, I feel like an inert lump, a stone, or a fallen log, infested with thousands of crawling insects as I lie helpless on the forest floor, my own time oozing past too slowly to deal with the thousand pricking beetles on my surface, I am being a realist. I am glimpsing something true about my being. There is thus a profound truth in the idea that, that, that depression is a kind of frozen wisdom, a philosophical insight expressing itself as a slow motion stream, our inertia. Inertia just is the persistence of a rift between essence and appearance. Theories of motion that imagine objects to be self-identical, consistent things that move from A to B in time, run, the Zeno's, run into the Zeno's paradox phenomenon that we explored earlier. But if an entity is driven from the inside, between itself, we must stretch drama to breaking point here, then it has all the resources it needs to move and change, and in particular we can explain inertia, which just is how an object keeps going or persisting without external input. What is frozen inside melancholia? The profound philosophical insight that a thing, in order to exist, is radically open. What is existing or continuing or persisting, it just means being indifference from oneself. Existing thus is futural, it is not yet. 